After multiple delays, we are finally graced with the holy presence of the Turn of Tides update. Along with it came an animated short revealing what's really happening here. A chunk of the moon has fallen down and caused the water levels of the constant to rise, and bringing the moon's strange magical influence with it. The first major mechanic in Turn of Tides is advanced boating, the new means to exploring the new ocean levels. Since the TOT beta, the boating controls have been vastly improved, making boating a much more bearable and less tedious task. Instead of having to click repeatedly to set your boat's heading using a steering wheel, you are now only required to click once, and your character will keep steering automatically until your boat is sailing in this direction. Additionally, boating is now a much faster activity, with less sails required in order to keep up a consistently high speed. Adding more sails will generally still give you a large amount of max speed and acceleration for each sail. Anyway, you might be wondering how to get started boating. It's pretty simple, honestly. Begin by building a think tank at a science machine for four boards. The think tank acts as a crafting station, responsible for prototyping all of the sailing related items. A boat kit is the most integral seafaring component and is built for four boards at the think tank. The boat kit can be launched at sea and will act as a blank canvas, ready to be decked out into your dream raft. In order to get moving, you'll need either an oar or a driftwood oar, crafted with either one log or one piece of driftwood respectively. With correct timing, an oar can be used to slowly row your boat along the open seas, useful for docking them or navigating through areas with many obstacles. But why row slow when you can sail fast? For a hefty three boards, three rope and eight silk, you'll have your very own sail, which can be placed on any boat platform. The sail can be raised and lowered at will, and will catch the winds and send you off at a brisk pace when raised. But don't set sail just yet, as you'll need to control your vessel to prevent damage. A steering wheel kit is made with two boards and one rope, and in one's place can be used to set the direction that your boat will sail in. Before you dash your craft onto rocks, consider constructing an anchor, made with two boards, three rope, and three cut stone. The anchor being a vital step in the process of not dying. Finally, if you are a tad eager with the velocity of your vessel, consider bringing a spare boat patch or two, built with one board and two stingers. When your boat impacts with land at a high speed, a leak will spring, which will drain the boat's health over time until it's patched up. The boat's health can be repaired using any wood item. Sailing overall is no cheap activity, as the minimum requirements for a sailboat is 15 boards, equivalent to 60 logs, 7 rope, 3 cut stone, and 8 silk. But what's the point of sailing the open seas, you may ask? Is there actually anything out there other than just endless water and the occasional rock formation? Why venture forth when I can just sit comfortably in my nice and warm base camp? Well, my friend, out in the ocean lies not comfort, but rather adventure. A strange new land with many magical features and creatures abound. Sail far out to sea and you'll come across this strange floating landmass. Locating it is a rather unreliable process, but you can get a general idea of where it is by exploring most of the normal world which will be in a U or horseshoe shape, and then sailing in a direction where a chunk of the land appears to be missing, or the middle part of the U, although this method is not 100% reliable. Once you reach the shores of this treacherous isle, be warned for many otherworldly horrors reside upon the terrible beaches. Upon berthing your beloved boat, your sanity meter will switch places with lunacy, which is active when you would normally be completely sane. Arrive at the island with an unstable mentality, and you will suddenly feel clear-headed. Celestial fissures dotting the landscape will slowly raise your lunacy meter, in addition to the constant increase just by being on the land. While at high lunacy, just dolts will make an appearance, small and irritating spirits who will launch an easily dodgeable attack that temporarily makes the player drowsy. Getting hit multiple times will put the player to sleep. The Jest Alt will disappear after doing this, and the attack does no damage, meaning that they're mostly an annoyance. The flora and fauna of this decrepit and desolate landscape is also of interest. The moon's influence appears to have corrupted some of the familiar faces from Constant Land, replacing them with demonic and unfamiliar parodies. Shattered spiders roam the area around their nests, much like regular spiders, but they are tougher and are able to cast a damaging AoE cone of crystal spikes. Other than that, they are pretty similar to our everyday arachnids, as they have normal spider drops. Second otherworldly beast you may encounter is the Moonrock Pengull, an icicled mishmash of organs and viscera. Moonrock Pengulls behave much like the normal variants, jumping out of the lunar ocean during winter. They are hostile to almost everything, dropping ice and monster meat upon death, although they do deal less damage and have less health than regular gulls. The final Lovecraftian fiend is the Horror Hound, a legged moor which has a chance to arise when a normal hound dies on the haunted shores. They have the same damage, health, and drops as an elemental hound, minus the respective gem. Overall, they can actually be rather beneficial, as they allow for extra teeth and monster meat opportunities for regular hounds, although they can of course overrun you should you be caught unprepared. In an emergency, you can light hound corpses on fire to ensure they do not rise again. Hey you! Yeah you! You should join my Discord server. It's a great place to discuss Don't Starve, or just to shoot the shit with some completely random people from the internet. You know, that totally normal activity that everyone does, all the time. So why don't you kickstart your career as a totally normal person, trademark, and join up! Links are in the description. 
While exploring the glassy plains, you may happen to stumble upon some more flora and fauna that are normally friendly towards the player. Loon trees dot the iridescent landscape, their dainty white flowers rustling in the sea breeze. Shopping them will yield six logs when fully grown, as opposed to the usual four when the stump is dug, although replanting them can be a chore, as you need to catch the moon moths spawn with a bug net and use them as a seed. Loon trees also drop loon tree blossoms, which can be eaten for one health or used as a crafting ingredient. Stone fruit bushes are a semi-common plant, yielding three stone fruit when harvested. Each stone fruit can be dropped on the ground and mined with a pickaxe in order to obtain a rock with a 34% chance, an edible stone fruit with a 65% chance, or a sapling to plant a new bush with a 1% chance. Stone fruit bushes can also be dug up and replanted, although they require fertilizing. If the stone fruits are left on the bush for too long, they will disintegrate when picked. Overall, they can make an excellent food source when mass replanted, as each harvest grants three potential stone fruits, plus they grow back after only three days. And enemies can be found growing on the beach biome, and they bite anything that stands on them for a hefty 60 damage. Their attack can be baited and successfully dodged, and they can also be dug up and used as a tooth trap alternative. They deal more damage than tooth traps, although they target everything and cannot be reset manually, as they operate on timer and reset automatically. As an additional plus, they have infinite durability. Carrots can be found disguising themselves as regular carrots. Upon attempting to harvest them, they'll run away, although they can be killed with melee weapons, similar to rabbits. Upon death, they'll drop carrot seeds and a leafy meat. Salad manders are territorial leafy lizards. They will claim a random hot spring as their own, and defend it from other salad manders by engaging them in a hissing battle. If the hot spring is bubbling from a bath bomb, or they're near any heat source such as a campfire, salad manders will slowly ripen, turning into a beefier version that deals increased damage and has a unique fire attack, which has the ability to set structures and players aflame. Salad manders drop a leafy meat when killed in normal form, and a dragon fruit when ripened. The final piece of content added in Turn of Tides is the Celestial Altar. Three Celestial Altar components will spawn near each other at a random position on the island. Mining and assembling them all in a Celestial Fissure in the correct order, base, orb, and then idle, will allow access to a bigger and better Celestial tab. At any time, the altar can be hammered and then reconstructed on another fissure. From the altar, a number of new craftables can be constructed. The Moon Glass Axe is the first of these, built with three moon glass and two sticks. Like the rest of the Celestial Recipes, it cannot be prototyped. It chops with a times 2.5 greater efficiency than a normal axe, at a significant durability cost, having 20 less hits than a normal axe, although its hit-to-log ratio remains higher than the Flint Axe. The Glass Cutter is crafted with one board and six glass shards, dealing 68 damage the same as a Dark Sword. It has 75 uses, but 150 when used against any Nightmare Monster, making it a pretty decent alternative to the Nightmare Sword. Since it cannot be prototyped, Dark Swords are generally a more viable option, as they can be built without the need to travel to a distant and corrupted island. Moon Crater Turf can be crafted with one Moon Rock and two Moon Glass. It's a purely decoration craft, as it does not spread the Moon's lunatic influence. Bath Bombs are made with six Loon Flowers and one Nighter piece. They can be thrown into hot springs, which will make Salamanders ripen. On the full moon, any bubbling hot springs will solidify into a Moon Glass Boulder. The boulder will drop a number of Moon Glass Shards and a small chance for a red or blue gem. And finally, two blueprints for unique structures can be prototyped from the Celestial Altar. Moon glass can also be used to make any sculpture, giving the statues a unique aesthetic. And that pretty much wraps up all the new content added in Turn of Tides. It isn't a ridiculously content-heavy update, but it does lay the groundwork for a turn of them, promising a lot of exciting new content in the future. Anyway, thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.